one of the earlier studies I did on functional brain imaging research on antisocial groups is a study in which we compared 41 murderers with 41 match controls. So these are murderers in California, United States. And this is uh, the imaging technique here is called positron emission tomography. It's a functional brain imaging technique. And the key finding from the study is, and just to orient you, you're looking down on the brain. The warm colors, red and yellow, indicate high glucose metabolism, meaning high brain functioning. And the cool colors, blue and green, low functioning in those parts of the brain. This part of the brain is the prefrontal cortex that you see activated in the normal control. This part is the occipital cortex, activated because the task we use to challenge the brains of these individuals is a visual task. So that's why the visual cortex is lit. If you look at an example from the murderer group, you see good activation in the visual cortex, no problem there. But you can see a lack of functioning in the prefrontal cortex. And that's the main finding of the study, that as a group, the murderers had poorer functioning in that prefrontal region of the brain. Now, we've seen earlier that murderers do have structural impairments in this part of the brain. And this early study, back to 1997, also showed that murderers have poorer functioning in that same part of the brain. What does that part of the brain do? It's involved in a lot of things, but two things in particular. Number one, it's involved in regulating emotion. So, you know, we all get angry, don't we, at times. We get angry, we get upset. What stops us lashing out and hitting someone? Well, we've got a good prefrontal cortex that's saying, step back. This isn't the time to go and hit someone. Count to ten. Keep your cool. Also, this part of the brain is involved in impulse control, checking on impulsive behavior. We can think of it like the guardian angel on behavior. But if the guardian angel, the prefrontal cortex, if it's asleep, as it is in some of these murderers, then the devil can get out, people can be killed. So, prefrontal dysfunction, poor functioning of the prefrontal cortex appears to be a risk factor for violent behavior. To me, it's the exception that proves the rule, because here we have a man who could pl carefully plan his murders. You need to have something good going for you to be able to do that successfully for 12 years. And what Randy had good going for him is a good prefrontal cortex allowing him to plan, to regulate, and control his behavior. So an important caveat here, it's not one size fits all. There's variation in who commits murder. A second caveat or caution to make about brain imaging research is this. We have another individual with a brain scan like this. And you can do pattern recognition, you can say which pile would you sort this individual in? Does it more look like this, the normal control? Does it look more like the multiple murderer? Does it look more like the murderer group? And, you know, there's no perfect match there. But it seems to be a bit more similar to the serial killer. Good frontal activation. Temporal lobe activation here. The thalamus. The thalamus on both sides is activated. We see that in Rundy Craft. Good occipital functioning, right? The point about that brain scan is that it's my brain scan. And the point to make about that is that clearly there are normal people like myself with abnormal brain functioning. And conversely, there are abnormal people, murderers, with totally normal brain functioning. Brain imaging is not diagnostic. 
It is not diagnostic. We cannot use it to say, who's normal? Who's a one-off killer? Who's a serial killer? No, we can't do that. Nevertheless, we are beginning to get clues about what brain areas, when dysfunctional, can predispose, can predispose to violence. And that's an important word. We're only talking about predisposing factors, factors that raise the probability or raise the odds that somebody will become antisocial and violent.